All right, this little talk is about the rise, fall, and rebirth in question mark um, of the of the so-called Caesarean text. Um, what what is the what is the Caesarean text? Um, you'll you'll get the whole lecture or definition of what a text type is with Peter's um, lecture after this, but what I'll just uh, briefly kind of in the, indicate what it is. It is a proposed text type in the Gospels, uh, usually uh, comprising the following witnesses um, of particular interest. Uh, P45, it's a papyrus third century. It's um, the um, until very recently, it was the earliest manuscript of uh, Mark, uh, but then, but then the um, uh, first, now third century Mark, I think that was that was recently discovered and published, uh, kind of kind of beats it out. Uh, but but that fragment is just like a few verses from Mark chapter one, p forty five, as extensive parts of Mark. Um, we also have O thirty two, the Washington Codex uh, W. Um, I'm so old. I still refer to everything by the uh, by the old sigla. So so I'm sorry for saying W and theta rather than uh, 032 and 038. Uh, so um, W is a uh, manuscript of the four Gospels. It is different. It's its text kind of changes from uh, from book to book. So in some books, it's closer to some manuscripts, and it kind of um, uh, differs like that. But but in Mark, uh, from chapter six on, it it has this interesting text that's been identified as the as the Caesarean. Uh, uh, we also have Codex Corydathi uh, Theta, that's in Georgia, the uh, the country, not the state. And uh, uh, we have some other witnesses here. Uh, family one, um, of which fifteen eighty two, I think, is the best uh, representative. Uh, we have family 13, 28, 5, 65, 700. Uh, but most importantly, it it also covers uh, Origen's text when he lived in the city of Caesarea Palestine. Um, and, and Origen lived there in the middle of the third century, so up to 250. And, and so he sometimes remarks on readings that are found locally in Caesarea, but not back in Alexandria where he moved from. And so, one of the big ones is on the next slide. Uh, uh, it, it has some distinctive and potentially quote unquote original readings. I'll let uh, Peter problematize original if he wants to, okay. but, uh, but I think the most famous one is in Matthew 27 where it refers to, uh, uh, refers to Barabbas, who's the, um, robber that the crowd released instead of uh, Jesus, and it gives him the name Jesus Barabbas. And so um, a, a lot of uh, people think that may actually be original or the earliest thing and in, in, in later manuscripts took out the name Jesus because they, they didn't want him to be associated with, uh, uh, with the Son of God. Um, uh, uh, the Caesarean text more distinctive and marked than in other Gospels, so uh, so you kind of see a lot of discussion focused on the Gospel of Mark. It it also helps that P forty five um, is the oldest part of Mark, and that um, Codex W Caesarean portion is in Mark, and and so that's um, that's why people tend to associate Caesarean text with. Uh, with Mark, although it, it may have a role to play in the, uh, the other Gospels, it's not quite as uh, distinctive or stands out, but but it's probably there as well. Um, it the the basic traditional text types have been uh, referred to as the Byzantine, Alexandrian, or Western. Um, uh, there's lots of issues about whether how coherent they are as textual groups, but but the basic idea is a Byzantine is a standard ecclesiastical text that arose um, at the end of late antiquity and, and came to dominate the medieval Greek transmission of the text. Um, um, where the Alexandrian uh, is thought to be earlier and more strictly controlled as Kurt Alon thinks. And then uh, the Western is another early 
kind of text, but it's not so strictly controlled that, that it, a lot of people um, thinks it kind of loses its cohesion and so it's so-called Western. But even so, the Caesarean text looks like none of these. And so um, some people think it may reflect the local text in Palestine. Uh, but what's important about the Caesarean text is that it lies at the center of the 20th century's controversy over what a text type is, how you define it, how, how you identify it. And, and in general, the rise and fall of the Caesarean text has to do with the rise and fall of our methods and definitions of what a text type is. And so, and so we'll see that as, as we go through the history of, of this text type. Um, so we'll begin with uh, Westcott and Hort. Um, they wrote the seminal theory of the New Testament text and they proposed that there were four forms of the text, uh, neutral, Western, Alexandrian, and Syrian. Uh, Syrian corresponds to our Byzantine. Um, neutral is kind of basically their favorite um, text, which is Codex Vaticanus and, and Codex Sinaiticus, both uh, fourth century, uh, really famous big uncial texts. I, I assume you've heard about them before. Have you told them about those texts? Yeah, yeah, we've read them, right? Yeah. Oh, oh, excellent. So, yeah. Um, neutral is kind of a loaded term. It's really their favorite text. And, 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 and these days we think of the neutral as like an early form of the Alexandrian um, text. I, I think, I, I, mean, I mean, in Paul and Galatians, I think they're right that those two are among the earliest and best witnesses of the text. But um, you have to look at others. But, but for Westcott and Hort, the Caesarean text did not exist at all. Um, most of the manuscripts that have been argued for it uh, weren't discovered yet, so they, so they couldn't have known about that. Uh, but but in, of the ones that they did know, they just thought that they were kind of these rare manuscripts that occasionally supported what they called Western readings. And, and, so, and so they were potentially witnesses, occasional witnesses of what might be earlier readings. And that's, that's all the interest that, um, that they would have among them. Uh, <clears throat> so Westcott and Hort in their uh, famous introduction, page 40, uh, lays down a fundamental principle. I guess it's the second principle. Uh, the first one is you have to study the actual manuscripts carefully, which, which you're doing by collating. Uh, but, but their second principle is that all trustworthy restoration of corrupted texts is founded upon a study of their history. And they define the history as the relations of descent or affinity which connect several documents. So, so basically genealogy is important. Um, if you want to understand the history of the text, you have to understand how these manuscripts relate to one another, how they were all copied, uh, which ones are more closely related to the others, which ones are copies of archetypes that uh, that occurred earlier. And, and if you don't understand that, you, you won't understand the history of the text. You can't really do textual criticism. Uh, and so, um, so they argue, so they, on, on page 46, they, they give a little maxim for how genealogy of manuscripts is discovered. And they say um, identity of reading implies identity of origin. It's, um, I, I think this formulation is incomplete and potentially misleading and they don't actually apply it that way. Although other people were, were misled by that. It's, um, it's really that it, community of error implies a unity of origin, which is the Lachman uh, common error principle that's used in classical textual criticism. And the, and the main idea is that if you agree in original readings, um, which is what the author wrote in, in the autograph, it, it doesn't tell you anything about their relationship other than the fact that they're both descendants of that autograph, but we already kind of know that. Um, what we're, what we're interested in is whether two manuscripts are descended of some later 
um, corrupted stage of the of the text. And for that, you have to find the errors that the scribes introduced. And um, and if they agree in those errors, then they're probably related through that um, a, a miscopied archetype. And and that's and that's why it's important to focus on community of error. Um, as, as, as one formulation puts it, rather than identity of reading, um, because some readings are more informative of genealogical relationships than others, and you got to filter out the ones that, uh, that, uh, that only tell you that you're, we're dealing with the Gospel of Mark, not some other Gospel kind of thing. Uh, the, the other thing about Westcott and Hort is that they never actually produced the genealogy of any New Testament text. And the one genealogy they gave was entirely hypothetical. Um, and in part, it's, uh, it, it's a really big test that was outside of, of the ability um, until quite recently. Uh, there are far too many manuscripts and they're way too contaminated or mixed with each other. Um, um, so what they did is they approximated the history of the text with a few well-chosen, uh, quote, best documentary representatives of the different forms of the text they had. So, so their neutral text is represented by Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus, these fourth century um, uh, majuscules. Uh, the Western text is represented by Codex Bizae D. And, and some old Latin, um, things like that. And so the Syrian text is, you, you have some leading um, uh, manuscripts there. I think in the gospels, Codex Alexandrinus A is like one of the, one of the earliest representatives there. And, and so, that's, so that's basically how they did textual crit, um, criticism. And, and up until quite recently, uh, and it's certainly the way in Metzger's handbook, that's how textual criticism mostly was practiced. It's called eclecticism. Um, Peter will get into more details about that. We've, with the advent of computers, we somewhat moved away from that kind of approximation uh, because we can now deal with a lot more data than Westcott and Horn ever could. Uh, but, but I'll let Peter um, lecture on that stuff uh, to you later. Um, so, uh, so the next, so there's no Caesarean text in Westcott and Hort, and and we do get the next um, um, stage of that with Cursop Lake, and he wrote Codex One and its allies in 1902, and and he made some methodological changes, and and he um, and. And he started building what is going to become the Caesarean uh, text. And so um, his main methodological change is that he modified the common error principle to look for variations from the standard text which they share in common. And by standard text, Cursop Lake meant the Byzantine text, the standard ecclesiastical text that was so dominant that it tended to, as, as scribes copied their um, uh, their other manuscripts, they tended to introduce Byzantine readings uh, because they just knew it so well. And they knew how the text should read because of their familiarity with it. It's in their liturgy. It's um, in, in all these things. And so there's a tendency of other forms of the text over time and as being copied tends to get more and more Byzantine. Um, uh, the later Alexandrians uh, start converging to this Byzantine standard. Um, as well over time. And that's probably what's happened with Caesarean ones. And so, so he kind of filters all their common uh, uh, Byzantine readings out and he looks only at the non-Byzantine readings that they um, share. Now, now one issue with this is that um, some non-Byzantine readings are errors which can establish genealogy, but but some non-Byzantine readings are, are the original readings and can't tell you anything about their history. And, and so he wasn't, um, uh, it's kind of important that Curse uh, Sop Lake's uh, methodological step kind of moves away from finding genealogy. Uh, but, but at any rate, he, he identifies a family one with one, 118, 131, 209. Uh, and I think now we would add 1582 to it. We 
we have a, a New Testament textual critic, Amy Anderson, who's been uh, spending most of her, her, her career kind of doing the um, family one in the variety of gospels. And so we're, we're, we're getting like a kind of a more modern, more rigorous treatment of that. Uh, Lake also noticed a close connection with family 13, which was discovered by William Farrar in the 1860s. Um, uh, also manuscript 22, 28, uh, 565 and 700. 565 is pretty important in, in, the, in the history of the Caesarean text. Um, so, so keep your eye on that one. And he speculated that these um, uh, witnesses belong to a larger family in some limited region in the east. And, and so that's, um, uh, that's what he did there. And, and so that's uh, 1902. And so we begin the 20th century with, with the establishment of this family. Um, now we go to uh, Lake and Blake, uh, Harvard Theological Review, 1923. And, and they add, uh, I, I chose an older picture of Kursop Lake here. And, and, and they added uh, 038, the Corridethi Codex Theta, to this alliance of manuscripts. And they considered it the uh, leading uh, member of, of this alliance. And then we get to um, Bernard Hillman Streeter. He uh, wrote Four Gospels, 1924. It is a very important book for uh, 20th century New Testament um, history. He, half, half of it's text critical, where he proposes the Caesarean uh, text type. Uh, the other half is source critical, where he um, sets out the case for the hypothetical source Q. Um, uh, both, both his proposals are somewhat fallen on harder times these days. And, you know, it, you know, in different ways, perhaps a mirage of the evidence that he's seen, but um, uh, uh, that's what this book is famous for. And so what, uh, we're, we're going to look at his text criticism, not a source criticism, um, so we won't be looking at Q. And, uh, and, and so what Streeter did is that he accepted Lake's findings for family theta, as uh, um, Streeter is now calling it, and he connected this family to the text of origin when he lived in Caesarea. Um, so, so that's the mid third century. And, and, and so we're looking at potentially a fairly early text earlier than the Byzantine, about the same age as um, the Alexandrian and Western texts that they uh, had, had heard of. But rather than look for agreements and error non-standard readings, he, he decided to um, calculate rates of overall agreements. Um, and and any witness that fell in agreement rates between Alexandrian ones and Western mm -hmm. ones, he considered Caesarean. So, so the way his methodology puts, it's kind of like a grab bag of manuscripts that don't fit. So, um, so, so anything that can't be easily classified as Alexandrian or Western and, and not Byzantine, they just end up in this category called um, um, Caesarean. And so he has a little chart, and this has to do with his local text theory, where he thought that every major text type what is can be identified with a uh, certain like important city in Christianity um, at the time. So, so the Alexandrian. Um, so, so the first one here. Um, so the city of Alexandria can be associated with uh, Codex Vaticanus as the primary authority. Um, you have Alas, which is Codex um, Sinaiticus. You have El, you have the Sahedic and Boharic, which are dialects of, of the Coptic language in Egypt. Um, then he has a number of tertiary witnesses. Mo most of these, I think 33 is important, but a lot of these are Alexandrian ones with a lot of Byzantine mixture in it. Um, and then he calls he calls supplementary, which which we would consider them Byzantine with some Alexandrian readings, and and his main uh, patristic authorities for this text is Origen when he lived in Alexandria, and 
and, and also uh, Cyril of Alexandria in the fifth century. Um, another important site for, uh, for Streeter is Antioch, and he considers that the source of the, of the um, uh, not quite. Um, so, so here he just has a list of Syriac witnesses. So we have the Sinaitic, we have the Curatonian, we have the, uh, uh, for the, uh, for, for the tertiary one, we have the Peshitta, he thinks the, uh, he thinks the Armenians in there. And, and so we have other Syriac witnesses there. Now in Caesarea, he, he identifies a primary authority as Theta, which is 038, uh, Codex Cordethi, but, but we have secondary witnesses as family one, family 13, 28, 565, 700. And these tertiary ones are basically kind of, um, have a lot more Byzantine um, um, affiliations in it. 424 is important. Uh, and Sigma, O and Pha. Uh, these are uh, these are the these are the purple uncials, which I think uh, we've had a recent study on by Elijah Hickson. They're uh, uh, they're all written on a purple um, vellum with with I think silver lettering, maybe gold, and and so they're really exquisitely produced, and they and they form a very interesting um, set of manuscripts on their own right. And and in Italy and Gaul, we have what we would call the Western text. Um, D Codex Basia is the primary authority. It's what fifth century, um, and we have some important old Latin ones A and B, and then um, its primary patristic witnesses is uh, Irenaeus um, out in France, and and then he has these other things here. So so he ties the Caesarean text with. Um, with his theory of local text, and he thinks it's a local text of the city of Caesarea in Palestine. Um, eventually, we'll move away from that theory, but that's what he said. Now, in a second edition with the new appendix, um, Streeter, and I chose an older picture of him, um, uh, looked at Codex W, 032, this Washington manuscript, in, in Mark 531 to 16.8, um, and he considered it the purest representative of this um, Caesarean text. And, um, and, and he found that 85% uh, of W's non-standard readings, and that is non-Byzantine readings, are supported by one or more members of family Theta. Now, now, when you get a, a support of just one member in this family, I mean, I mean, it could be some kind of coincidence or anything like that. So basically, anything that these fairly divergent manu these non-standard manuscripts, any reading in it could be potentially um, um, Caesarean, even if it just has a support of one, and and so that that's the way um, Streeter's method kind of works, and so he. He thinks it's a big deal that he's found all of these um, that manuscripts with interesting readings and he puts it together in the Caesarean uh, text. Uh, then we get to a fesh shrift uh, written for Cursop Lake, 1937, and he uh, adds even more uh, uh, codec, cod codices 157 and 1071 to his to a Caesarean text. And as a result, for Streeter, the Caesarean text includes both readings and manuscripts that were not clearly Byzantine, Alexandrian, or Western. And um, how it kind of fits into this whole text type theory of, of, of uh, editing. If you take this seriously, you would consider a, a, a Caesarean like on par with the other, other ones when you do your um, when you do your eclecticism and you kind of say, okay, what's the distribution of a reading among the test, text types? And if you believe in the Caesarean text, then, then there's a whole kind of source of non-standard readings out, out there. Um, I don't think it, it, except in a very few cases like this Jesus or Sabbath, I don't think it has made that much of an impact on, 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 the, on the text that we've had, but it's, as a result, it's more interesting for historical and mythological grounds. Um, um, Teofilo Ayuso published an article in 1935 looking at the newly discovered Papyrus 45. And, um, 
he, he found that um, it was similar to some Caesarean texts, but not others. And so he uh, divides the Caesarean text into two parts. One he calls pre-Caesarean. Um, so that's got Papyrus 45, W, Family 1, Family 13. And then you have Caesarean proper with Theta 565 and 700. Um, so, so what this means is that if you believe with Streeter that um, Codex Theta is the leading representative of the Caesarean text type, um, uh, then, then these other things don't really belong to it. And, and so this is the first kind of step to the fall or the dissolution of the Caesarean text type is, is that they're, um, what Streeter is putting together is now being kind of um, uh, uh, torn apart. In, 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 a, in a variety of ways. Um, now we're going to get to uh, Ernest Cadman Colwell, who's the leading American textual critic of the mid 20th century, uh, uh, well, the main guy before Bruce Metzger. And in the, not, uh, and in the 1950s, he called for a meth methodological refocus uh, for New Testament textual criticism that, that he thought the big problem in the field was just not having good methodology. Um, too many people are just do, doing their own thing and everything's not tightly um, na nailed down as the best way to do it. Uh, methodology became important in other fields of New Testament uh, studies at the same time. And so we get your redaction criticism, you get all this kind of stuff. So. The mid 20th century was really big on methodology and uh, Colwell was one of them. Uh, so, so there's a couple of things he did is, oh, I got a typo. Um, he, he defined a text type as a group of documents, not a collection of readings, not, not reasons, but readings. Uh, you, know, you know, I put these typos in there to make sure that when you fall asleep, you actually wake up uh, at, at key points in the, in the, in the lecture. And, um, and the other thing is he disagreed with Streeter and Lake's approach of looking at deviations from the Texas Receptus uh, by, by counting overall agreements. Um, um, I mean, you have to realize that when Lake and, and others talk about deviations from the standard Byzantine text, we didn't really have an addition of the standard Byzantine text. We just had the Texas Receptus. And so they, they were filtering out agreements with the standard Texas Receptus type. And uh, uh, the only problem is that one of the manuscripts that the Texas Receptus, that went into the Texas Receptus is manuscript one. And, and that's part of family one and that belongs to the accessories and types. So, so there's a um, certain kind of circularity in um, what, what's going on? You're filtering out stuff from that disagrees with, with the Texas Receptus, although one of the elements of the Texas Receptus is actually the family that you're most interested in. So nobody ever really untangled that very well. Um, I don't think fam one had a major influence on the actual text of the Texas Receptus, so it might be a case of uh, no harm, no foul kind of thing. But 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 there are a lot of methodological problems with with, okay, I want to filter out the standard text, but I don't have the standard text. I have this other thing that approximates it, but the thing that approximates it is also contaminated with what I'm looking for. Um, um, so you have that issue. And um, Cole, and uh, Cole, what uh, he's famous for, and it's like one article um, that he co-wrote with Ernest Toon, is that he proposed a quantitative method. So part of his methodological refocus is to kind of be a little bit more rigorous and exact about how you define text types. And so we, we get this famous article from 1961 where he and, and his uh, colleague, Ernest Toon, um, took a sample of 18 manuscripts and calculated their overall agreement rates with, with one another. And, and they chose kind of very, um, uh, uh, the best documentary representatives of these types as they were already known. And, and they found that in their sample um, that, that the ones that belong to the same 
text type agreed with each other at least 70% of the time. I think the Byzantine ones were up in the 90s. And they all had like a 10% gap in agreement uh, uh, between the other ones. And so they actually proposed that that ought to be the, uh, uh, um, you can distinguish text types based on this minimum agreement rate and this gap. Uh, and they expressed the hope that their numbers would hold up if you add more manuscripts to it. Um, that turns out not to be the case. Um, if, you, if you add more than 18 manuscripts and you bring it up to 40 or 50, it turns out the gap just goes away. And, and, then, this, and, then, the, and then the agreement rates tend to start um, coming down. And then, you know, is it 70% or is it 65? And you, and, and, and you get all these issues and it's just really, really hard to, uh, work with, but but their main methodological uh, innovation, if you will, is that they counted overall agreements, not deviations from the Texas Receptus, and they uh, uh, and they didn't count any agreements in error, so it it was all agreements, whether they're original or secondary. Now, overall agreement, although it can approximate genealogy if you're lucky in in some cases, it's not a genealogical criterion, so it, it'll find similar manuscripts, not necessarily related ones. Um, so, uh, uh, so that's the issue there. Uh, the next major step, and this really coincides with the fall of the Caesarean text, is Larry Hurtado in his dissertation, Text Critical Methodology and the Caesarean Text, 1981, is when it was published, but he did a lot of the work earlier in the uh, 70s under, um, I think, Eldon App at Case Western Reserve. And um, what what he did is he applied the Colwell and Tune quantitative method to the Caesarean text, and he chose as, uh, as the best representatives um, certain manuscripts for the text type. So, um, so the Alexandrian one gets Codex Sinaiticus and Codex Vaticanus, Western gets Bize, Byzantine gets Alexandrinus and the Texas Receptus, um, a Caesarean text, and he takes the use of division between the two. Um, so for the Caesarean text, he looks at Theta, he looks at 565, and for the pre-Caesarean text, he's, he, he looks at P45, W, and Family 13. And he does both a quantitative and a qualitative analysis. Um, so it's not just this mathematical method. He also looks at the readings and uh, um, um, see, uh, sees how strongly or compelling that they are. And so his quantitative findings are, and, and this gets real interesting, uh, that the agreement between W and theta in the last part of Mark, and the reason you need to do Mark 6 through 16 is because in the first part, W has a different text, uh, is, is as low as uh, 37, uh, almost 40%. Well, 565 and theta are pretty high overall of mark, 68%, which is close to that 70% level. Um, but 565 and W kind of drops down to 40% again. And, and what's interesting is that theta and D, Codex Bize on, on Hurtado's calculations agree together 45% which is even stronger than, um, uh, other, other than how W agrees with, with the Caesarean members. So Hurtado concludes that if W is, is Caesarean, then, then the Western, uh, then the leading Western witness, Codex Bize, would be an even better member of this type. So, um, uh, so, uh, so he thinks that means there isn't anything real to this, um, a larger Caesarean text type with Codex W out, out, outside of perhaps a smaller group of 565 and theta. And then he looks at shared genetic readings, which, which I would call his qualitative findings. And, and it's not that he looks at the number of agreements or the rates of agreements, he looked at the agreements. And, um, and anyway, and, and he thought that many of the agreements between W and theta uh, were, uh, were superficial as far as he was concerned. It, they look like easy scribal mistakes that they could do coincidentally or, or like other things like that. 
and he found that that W has many striking agreements with D and other Western witnesses. And so, so his main conclusion was that W and Theta were not members of a text type that can be differentiated from the so-called Western. And, and Hurtado was even um, somewhat skeptical that the Western text was, was a valid text type in its own right. He, he thought it might be have a lot of similar scribal um, uh, scribal changes or habits that scribes would do were all kind of similar and not very well coordinated and, and, and things like that. So it's always more like a tendency of how the text to develop rather than a proper text type. And that kind of leaves the, um, the whole um, issue of the text types at, at that stage. It just kind of ends there. The, uh, the Germans in Munster under um, Kurt Alon started thinking about, uh, well, maybe not text types, but whether the papyri are, that, that we're going to look at it, are they strictly controlled or are they loose uh, uh, like that? And so all the, all the, all the, all, all the manuscripts they like that were strictly copied tended to be Alexandrian and the ones that aren't, you know, we would recognize as Western. And so um, it's that now. Uh, we'll move to me in 2004. Um, this is an older picture of me, but not from back then. My photos don't go back that far. Um, this is actually my paper on the text of Galatians uh, 4.25, but um, you, you can't tell that. Uh, what I did is I used a uh, cladistic technique known as maximum parsimony. This is this is using computers. I used to be a computer programmer um, to basically go back to the beginning and implement um, Carl Lachman's common error principle that he articulated uh, back in the 1830s uh, for classical textual criticism. Um, uh, biologists have already figured out and written, you know, devised algorithms to do that. And then they only realized later that this had all been figured out by textual critics. Um, um, so it's nice to have a lot of their, uh, <clears throat> basically the computer work was uh, uh, pretty much done and worked out. Um, but, the, but the theoretical basis goes all the way back to the beginning of uh, modern textual criticism in the uh, early 1800s. Um, I, I quickly figured out that you can't deal with this text without worrying about mixture. So I used uh, Michael Weitzman's bipolarity assumption and kind of updated the cladistic techniques to allow for, uh, for mixture. And I applied it to 58 witnesses of Mark in the, um, in, in 645 to 826, it's a Betha Eda section where it corresponds to Luke's great omission. So, so there wouldn't be any source of, um, uh, of uh, variants that come from people, scribes knowing the text of Luke better and, and those coming in there, it kind of filters that out. Although there's, um, you do have Matthew there. So, um, so it's at 829 variation units of which um, 262 are singular and 567 are informative. And, and it produced a stemma of which I couldn't put it all on the screen Maybe, maybe I could, um, can I, can I share another screen? Is that possible? Uh, let's see. Yeah, this one here. All right. Can you see that? No. Oh, uh, let me hit share. Is that, is that visible now? There you go. Yes. Okay. So we have a big stemma here for this portion and, and I've labeled some of these branches and um, I and, and, and for this paper I took the shortcut that the uh, UBS text was the original um, for my uh, Galatians work I actually reconstructed it um, there but but if you but if you believe that the UBS text is right you you get two branches one I called beta which is your um, head by uh, Codex Vaticanus B here. Um, can you see my cursor when I move it around? 
Yeah. Yes. Okay. And and then you have um, other members which are basically considered Alexandrian or primary Alexandrian. And then the and then the tradition splits off to uh, to another grouping. And then this Ada is basically secondary Alexandrians. So you have C five um, seventy nine and thirty three, and then it splits again, and and you have two branches here, gamma and delta, and delta corresponds to uh, the uh, the Western text, and so you have Codex D in there, although it doesn't appear to be a pure member on this analysis, and 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 you have the old Latin um, labeled IT, and, and so. But, but this whole gamma thing is a very interesting branch and a lot of the members of the Caesarean text falls in, into this clade, if you will, which is this branch of the tradition, um, headed by Lambda, which is the Lake group, uh, family one. So you get 1582 and, and one here. And then you have all this other stuff, which can't be discriminated very carefully because we don't have a full text of that, but we have origins text. K is Codex Bobiensis, um, a divergent old Latin type. Uh, we have 28 in here, and then we have this P45 and W. And, and one thing interesting is that there's a clear relation between W and Codex D. Biza that, that, that it looks like that um, Codex W is not a pure member of this of, of this type, but has a lot of um, influences um, related to D. And then we have this little group Theta, which is um, 565 Theta 700, which they all thought were part of the Caesarean text. And this appears to be a different mix, mixture with, with Western ones. Um, and then theta itself seems to have some, all the way here, some Alexandrian affinities. And uh, 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 family 13 um, look, looks like a Byzantine um, Caesarean mix. And then and then the Byzantine text here, alpha uh, may itself be some kind of, uh, on this analysis, um, some kind of conflation of of a Alexandrian and a Caesarean thing. So this brings back this whole, um, uh, you know, this whole recension theory or conflation theory of Westcott and Hort. I, I don't want to get into, but 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 that's what pops out of this thing here. So it looks like that that the Caesarean uh, branch is. Um, there in the stemma, it's pre-Byzantine, but but its members are mixed. Uh, now, let me see. I'm going to go back to the screen here, right? All right. So, we're, so are we back to yep, there? So, so uh, so I'm going to restate these uh, findings here. Uh, there, there is a Caesarean branch, so you could kind of talk about a Caesarean text, uh, but many of its witnesses are mixed. W in particular is mixed Caesarean and Western. There, there is a branch, Theta, um, and it's a different mixture. And then Theta itself is further mixed. Family 13 is mixed, and, and the Byzantine branch is a mixture of that. And, and so you get this idea that there's a lot of mixture going on, which kind of explains why it's so uh, difficult to get a handle on this text because um, other, other relations are not very consistent. Sometimes they agree with one or another and, and, and then it's uh, kind of tough there. Uh, but basically is if you're gonna talk about the Caesarean text at all, it's not W because it's mixed. It's not theta because that's mixed. Uh, you probably ought to, ought to be looking at family one, um, which has some connections with the text of origin. And so we could, might possibly even be able to locate it in, in us in the Caesarea mm -hmm. with origin. Uh, so, so, uh, so if you care about that, then that would make family one a more interesting and important um, text and in, in this part of the Gospel of Mark. Now the main issue is whether to, to what extent you can um, 
generalize that beyond this part of Mark to Mark as a whole of the Gospels. And then in the case of W, these manuscripts are going to shift text types and some are going to be more Byzantine and things like that. So, uh, so it's really a whole uh, area is left to be discovered. But, but it does appear to be that there's some underlying reality for the Caesarean text, but it's so uh, mixed and, and under um, layers of other texts that it's really hard to untangle. Um, all right, our next step here is uh, Rob Tur Turnbull. And uh, he just wrote a dissertation, uh, which is going to be published. And it's a detailed study of a set of Arabic manuscripts in the Gospels. And, and so what he did is he applied um, uh, what, one of the many things he did, and I could probably get Rob to explain in better detail, but um, he applied cutting edge Bayesian ph phylogenetic techniques to the text of Mark. Uh, uh, the other uh, technique that I applied was, uh, uh, was much more popular in the 19, I don't know, 80s or 90s. And, and so this is, this is really uh, current stuff. And, and he deals with the issue of Byzantine contamination by, um, uh, he could explain in more detail, but basically is that he considers changes to the Byzantine text to be a lot more frequent than changes away from it, uh, uh, to put it basically. And, and so that can account for Byzantine uh, contamination fairly well, although, we, although it's not intended to be a, a particular study of, of whether texts are mixed or not. And, and so he comes up with, with his findings and he finds uh, four, uh, four texts in Mark uh, labeled Alexandria and Caesarea and Byzantine and Western and how they're all kind of there. Uh, uh, this text in red, I don't know if you could see it, is the, is the Arabic witnesses he's, he's studied. And, and it looks like uh, they're at a pretty, uh, maybe not the earliest part of the uh, earliest branch of the Caesarean text, but they're pretty uh, well up there. And, and, and it looks like you can't really um, do much work with the Caesarean text without looking at the Arabic. So, so, the, so the takeaways I get from mm -hmm. Rob's work is that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Caesarean witnesses form on this other analysis as well, a distinct clade or branch of the tradition. Uh, it contains some important mm -hmm. versions like the Syriac, uh, Arabic, Armenian, and Georgian. And the most basal member, which is right at the top here, is W. So, so we have a bit of a disagreement over how important W is. That's fine. Uh, and, and so that's where he's at. And then um, I would just like to basically state conclusions about the Caesarean text. I realize this is like super technical. Uh, but, but the main lessons I want to um, take away from this is that the rise, fall, and potential rebirth of the Caesarean text parallels the rise, fall, and rebirth of new methods and New Testament textual criticism. And so um, to a large extent, the entities or the, the way we think the text developed depends a lot upon how we study the text and how we relate manuscripts to um, to uh, to uh, to each other, and I haven't said anything about the uh, CBGM, but it doesn't take a text type approach and has a different way of um, thinking about these things, such that a lot of text critics, uh, particularly those who follow it, just don't even um, think that the text type approach is very fruitful as a result. And that's also methodologically driven. They have a different way of looking at um, basically how potential ancestors operate. And uh, that's a um, that's a, a time for another uh, lecture, but um, but <clears throat> while there does appear to be a distinctly non-Byzantine and non-Alexandrian set of witnesses that are somewhat related to Western witnesses, um, uh, you can't really study them unless you do two things. And, and number one, you got to take mixture into account. Um, the, these aren't uh, 
uh, these texts aren't copied from a single manuscript all the time in a very kind of strict and controlled fashion like we see among Byzantines, like we see among Alexandrians. And also importantly, you have to take the versions into account. You got to look at the Syriac, you got to look at the Arabic, you got to look at the Armenian, you got to look at the Georgian. And, and some of these languages are really beasts to learn. Uh, but, but, but you really won't understand this form of the text until you look at these versions. And, and I'd say that's true for the Western, you have to know Latin and, and the Alexandrian, you have to know Coptic as well. But, but those are the two main lessons that are three. Method's important, mixture's important, and, and the versions are important. And, and I'll leave it there. I wonder if Rob would have anything to add since, um, since I talked about your work and, and, and you're in a better position to discuss it. No, I think you summarized it really well. Yeah, it was, uh, that was terrific. Okay, um, so that comes to an end. I, I don't know what we'll do next, Peter, but- we, Do you have time to do some Q&A, Stephen? Uh, yes. I wanna keep you, keep you too long, so maybe let's take 10 minutes, okay? Oh. Or, or less if we don't have as many questions. I've got questions, but I always have questions. So I wanna let them ask. Okay, so I should get rid of the screen sharing. Sure. Questions? Yeah. Oh. All right. Um, so you mentioned with your stomata, the, the, at the top, you were pretty much comparing it off, starting with the UBS um, to kind of develop your stomata. I guess why the UBS? If I guess why wouldn't you pick like an already existing manuscript in order to? It would seem like starting with already a completion of manuscripts, UBS and Nestle Allen would mess up. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. For that work. Um, it, it really kind of works in two parts. Um, the, the, the method that I have, you can think of it, it, it has two steps. The, uh, the Maxim Parsi method allows the manuscripts to be related to one each other, but, but it's not really directional. It doesn't tell you which one comes first and which comes later. And you have to look at it afterwards, the other uh, readings and find the place in this undirected, uh, 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 this, uh, this undirected stemma, what's it uh, we'll called, unrooted stemma, and find a place in the stemma that is closest to the original. And that takes a lot of um, detailed text critical work for this paper at SBL. I said, well, let's, let's assume that our um, the edition basically got it right. So if we were to orient this stemma and find it uh, find the top of it, it'd be where UBS says it is. And, and that's all I used uh, for there. When I did the work on Galatians, as a proper doctoral dissertation, you aren't allowed to take that shortcut. You have to go through in there and say, okay, let me look at all the places where UBS isn't right. And, you know, I, I found like 13 uh, places in Galatians where I had a different opinion of which uh, I think one was a different verb form. Uh, you know, they were all kind of like, I mean, I, I mean, I disappointed my advisors for not finding anything super interesting, but, but, but I frankly think that our text is pretty good as it is. Um, you know, at, at, at most is whether it's Peter or James, uh, you know, showed up in Antioch, um, you know, so there, you still have justification by faith, you know, none of that goes away. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so what you read in your Bibles is, 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 is still good, but if you want to know how things are spelt, you know, I might have a few places where I could tell you about that, uh, which... Don't undersell it, Stephen. Don't undersell yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, I know, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's one reason why people got this whole issue. Should it focus on the original text or should it focus on the history of texts and other things like that? I think it should focus on both. But but the same part of it is because I think we've done a really good job on the on the on the on the on the original text, and so most of what we have to learn is in places later on. Um, that's that's why. It, and 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 the, every once in a while, I think we will get to a point where we say, you know, I think it should say this rather than that, and uh, I'm I'm perfectly fine with that. I, I spent a lot of time looking at Greek word order because it doesn't get translated, but 
but but that's one of the things you need to do in order to um, um, to establish the text there. So yeah, yeah. So the reason I use UBS is just as a shortcut to uh, to root the stemma um, as it is. If you're to do it properly, you go ahead and you look there and. And, and you might decide that, well, the real division in Mark isn't between the primary Alexandrians and everything else, but maybe the primary and secondary Alexandrians and everything else, or maybe maybe family one is really the best or, you know, or somewhere up there. Um, so. You probably mentioned too, Stephen, because I, I didn't mention earlier, but you guys probably know, as far as I know, Stephen, you're the first to apply cladistic methods to the New Testament. Is that right? Or was there anybody that you know before you? Um, I was the first to apply it to edit the text to like say, this is what I think the original is. Yeah. Um, some people in um, working with Klaus Vachtel, this is Michael Spencer. Yeah. There was a group yeah. with the Canterbury Tales. They entered the data from James and they said, here is a... Right. You could put in the clitic, so it doesn't handle mixture at all. Um, but they put it in there and says, yeah, it kind of gives the same results as what everybody's working on. Isn't this neat? And and that's basically it. I mean, they input into a computer program, yeah. uh, but there isn't, but it wasn't used to actually do textual criticism. It, yeah. it was just used as a, like a proof of concept yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that that could give Good some results. Yeah. Okay. So um, I guess I'll take the last question and let you, let you guys go. Um, one thing that's that's that you didn't you, you mentioned Caldwell's definition. Actually, I think you guys read that first night, didn't you? Yes. Yeah. Um, the one thing you we we don't get, Stephen. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, and Rob, yours too. Is um, we don't get a you know certainly not a statistical definition of text type. So if we went back to Rob's um, stemma that you had on the screen there a minute ago, you know, one question I would have is where do we draw the, the breaks you know you had your cut your four colors to me it looked like oh great we're just over you know these are our traditional ones and look we see them there too but like i could draw those boxes differently and end up with five text types or seven text types maybe depending on where i want to put the breaks do you have any just thoughts on that i know that's a huge question Stephen, but or, or rob but i'd love to hear your thoughts on it yeah it kind yeah. of dissolves text types in a different way uh basically any branch of the tradition can be its own text type yeah. and and so and so if you have 80 for example if you have 82 manuscripts the number of branches that you could have is 81 of them and on, on average and so and so you could almost have as many text types as you have uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry it's 81 times two um, so you could almost do as many text types as you want. And, and so there's a very subjective element of which branches we care more about than others. And, and so one way of doing it is to, um, you could look for the amount of divergences or changes or errors upon each line and, and the ones that have greater, um, things like that so have greater errors in common uh, might be a better candidate for a text type or not because you're going to see them more together often. Um, also, you could do statistical techniques like bootstrapping to determine how well supported some of these nodes are. And and so this wasn't done here, but but it was done in um, in, in my Galatians work where where you can get a full stemma, very kind of um, uh, detailed thing of where all of the um, Byzantine manuscripts, I think this is more closely related to that, but if you run it into the bootstrap, they're saying, oh, we can't tell. It's just basically, they're all closely related and, and any kind of um, agreements you might see in Galatians might just be noise or coincidence. And, and so, um, and that's particularly true among the Byzantine texts. It's really, well, there aren't enough variants in Galatians to get a full, a, a full history of that text. It's just it's 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 just amazing how how well copied or strictly controlled that text is. So uh, so so Parliament's judgment. The the other thing is text types feed into doing um, this basically this eclectic uh, method of textual criticism where you where you look at to see how a reading is distributed among the text types. But if you're not doing that method anymore, um, 
then you know then what's the point of text types yeah yeah I'm with you. rob you want to add anything yeah. to that yeah, I, I agree with everything Stephen said, and Peter, you're absolutely right. The, those colors are totally arbitrary, and I, I talk about that in the in the uh, in the monograph in the thesis. Uh, I just colored them there for convenience, but the it's it's far more it's far more useful, I think, to talk about clades um, yeah. as uh, so. And you and you can see the numbers on that um, uh, on that uh, chart. Uh, it gives you the the probability that each each clade exists in the from the coming out of the analysis. So that's the I think those are the uh, that is analogous to what Stephen was saying about the bootstrapping. But this is been in a Bayesian framework. You can yeah. come up with these probabilities of uh, how how likely these particular manuscripts are to form a particular branch. Yeah. So it's yeah. So it's I'd be more interested to think of uh yeah clades and also branch lengths like what Stephen was saying how how many changes do we find along these branches to do, to right. talk about clusters and that kind of thing and then in in your opinion rob we still have to take that you know take this nice looking stemma and somehow turn that into actual history <laughs> Is that yeah. right? like i mean you know looking at the picture it looks nice neat, nice, nice and tidy but yep. we still have to somehow map that onto actual centuries and history and, and development because, you know, you could have a long branch <clears throat> that happens over a short period of time. You could have a short branch that actually happens over a long period of time. So we can't, That's right. can't just look at it and simply assume, oh, this is the history that we're Yeah, exactly. That right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's right. This is, it's it's, it's got to be part of a, a much bigger analysis. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Right. And that's why... Um, that's why looking at patristic witnesses are important because you could locate yeah. them to a time and a place. Um, the you know, problem is they often don't quote a lot of the text or they don't um, yeah. quote it very well. And so you have to deal, deal with that, but those are well-known problems. Yeah. All right, so, so last question, this is kind of an up or down. All right, I'm gonna force you to just give me an up or down. Having done your work, are you optimistic that we should keep using the language of text types or should we do away with it? Uh, I would say no, no. I would say that the language of text types only makes sense for eclecticism. And since we've moved away from that form of editing, it, uh, it ought to be retired and we should think about other things like branches of the tradition or yeah. or other things that make more sense for the newer methods that we have yeah. Yeah. and rob you feel the same uh i'm happy to use it with with caveats but i'd prefer to use terms like branches okay all right, all right. good okay not clusters not clusters they're asking if you like clusters better clusters <laughs> is a lot of effort tonight <laughs> cl clusters is like a branch of uh, where the uh, where the branch lengths are very short. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Just another, just another name for the same thing as text types, in my view. But whatever. All right, yeah. gentlemen, thank you so much for giving us of uh, your time. We really appreciate. It. That's a great. It's going to be a great segue into our, our lecture tonight. So thanks so much to, for for coming to us tonight and for coming from so far away.